calling me, you Listen to me. You ever ask a man how he's doing and he says, I'm all right. I'm here to tell you, that man is not all right. That man is battling demons that you cannot even possibly imagine. That man is struggling every single day to find a reason to keep going. One of the things that I struggle with most is those moments where I'm by myself and I'm breaking down, knowing that nobody knows how sad I am or how much I'm hurting. It's really, really hard to just move. <laughs> it's um. No, I feel. I yeah. It's it's hard to get out of bed. It's hard to even go downstairs to get something to eat. No, I just have loneliness now, haunting loneliness. Tell me about that. No, I don't. I don't want to. Nothing to tell, David. Sometimes you're just lonely? Yeah. And what do you do to help yourself with the loneliness? I don't go to bed. I stay up all night. And that makes you feel awful too, so... Everybody's tired all the time, right? No matter how much sleep we get or caffeine we consume, but also we have a lot of trouble even just falling asleep and we're constantly hungry, but also kind of always nauseous and we're chugging more water than any other generation has ever chugged before, yet we're still dehydrated and we're losing hair and getting wrinkles, but also still have acne despite having the most intense skincare routine and we're spending every waking moment either working or cleaning, but feeling like nothing Nothing ever actually gets accomplished and we want to go out and make and see our friends but staying at home is all we really have energy for so we're juggling this like want to isolate ourselves but craving connection so we just scroll and scroll and scroll and we feel like we're wasting our life but the life that's been set up for us just sucks and you think that it's burnout but you know since 2020 our body hasn't even really known what reality feels like anymore how are you? I'm okay. Yeah. <sighs> Sorry. <sighs> okay. Um. So why even bother to say it? But you know what? I feel you, brother. Because, uh, I'm alright, too. Stop calling me, you Listen to me. We traced the call. It's coming from inside the house. You hear me? It's coming from inside the house. You need to get out of there right now. You? The call is coming from inside the house. Thank you, Heath. Thank you, Jonathan and Aslan. Thank you, Maylene. Thank you to the production team for helping us with that. It's an uncomfortable truth to sit with, isn't it? The call is coming from inside the house. So if the oppressor never just offers the freedom, how do I stand up? and demand it. Emancipate yourselves from mental slavery, none but 
ourselves can free our minds. There's truth in that. It walks a line. None but ourselves can take our thoughts captive to the mind of Christ because he won't do that part for us. When he died and descended into the grave, he led captivity captive, made a public spectacle of oppression, of anxiety, of fear, of the curse of sin and death. He made a public spectacle of the one whose sole purpose is to make a public spectacle out of your downfall. He ate and he left no crumbs. But he said, you're going to have to eat too. Because if you don't find a way, Pastor Jonathan sent out our weekly reading assignment this week. If, if we don't find a way to take it in, to take him in, it's uncomfortable, isn't it? Lil Nas X said, now we know who the heathens are. Because some of these holy people just looked at me like, what? Was that a message in tongues? <laughs> but the gigglers, we'll pray for you. Don't ask me how I know. Lil Nas X said, I'm coming into my Christian era. I didn't need to see him dress up in an effeminate robe and make a mockery of the crucifixion and openly commit the sin of gluttony with the Lord's Supper on video. The Bible expressly says, that's not a snack. If you're hungry, eat at home. Paul said, if you... If I haven't run enough of y'all off already, God help us. <laughs> Thank you. Holy Ghost, help me. Paul said, <laughs> that was a good callback. Paul said, if you like a glass, ooh, it got real tight in here. Listen, he wasn't endorsing that. He just said, do that mess at home. Because that's not what this is. This is not about the desires of the flesh. I'm going to tell you something that ought to scare you. Because the old school preachers, and nobody knows it better than this house, the old school preachers would say, you sipping saints are going to bust hell wide open. The old school preachers would say, if you have a glass, right, you might as well have a cask. I'm going to say something that ought to scare you worse than that. 
Only you know whether you're fulfilling the lust of the flesh or exercising your Christian liberty. That's the truth. You and God, you know. I can tell you what I discern. I can tell you what I see, but you know. Ain't no Holy Ghost filled believer ever poured a glass of anything or gone to the fridge at midnight and got out the peanut butter, the cold pizza, and the jelly and started making comfort snacks. No Holy Ghost filled believer has ever done that and wondered whether or not they were fulfilling the lusts of the flesh, the desires of the flesh, you know. You know if your appetites are in, con in control. You know if they're subjugated to the spirit or if they're controlling you. I think that's kind of what Bob Marley was getting at. Emancipate yourself from mental slavery. In other words, he will put the truth right in front of you. He, he, he lived it. He became the truth. He didn't become the truth. He was the truth, and he became the truth incarnate. He became the truth in human form. He lived it out right in front of us. But the truth is, only the truth can make you free. Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So here's what disturbed me. Lil Nas X didn't disturb me. I'm praying for Lil Nas X. Lil Nas X was raised in church, but when I hear him talk, it breaks my heart because I know he never really got it. He said something in his defense video about that mess, that blasphemous mess that he did. And he said something about, I thought, I thought my little joke about communion would just be the lighthearted part that would pull everybody together. And then he said something that revealed the fact that he didn't even understand what was offensive about him standing there in a dress drinking up all the wine and eating all the crackers while his godless music played behind him, his beat. He said, I wasn't trying to act like a cannibal or something like that. He said, I know it's supposed to be something about the blood and the bones of Jesus or something. That, that, that poor kid was raised in church. I'm not saying anything about his mama, his daddy, his youth pastor. His pa I don't know. I don't know who didn't see trouble coming. Or if they saw trouble coming, who didn't raise the alarm. Lil Nas X had a decision to make and... and at this moment, he has decided, if you don't know who he is, don't worry about it. You know what I'm talking about. He has decided at this time that he wants to spend his inheritance on prodigal living. That doesn't mean that, that God can't change that decision. That doesn't mean that the father's not waiting back at the house. That doesn't mean we shouldn't pray for him. Far as I can see, we've got no reason to do anything but pray for him, reach for him, love him. What freaks me out is that somebody could go on Twitter and say, I'm coming into my Christian era to promote their upcoming blasphemous pseudo hymn. Say, I'm coming into my Christian era and the discernment blogs and influencers and so-called discernment ministries of the church went wild trying to analyze and decide whether this sounds like a sincere, is, is Lil Nas X really moving toward Jesus? No, he's not moving toward Jesus. He said, Christian era, what are... 
Do you think Jesus is like a, a side quest? I'm not mad at him. I'm freaked out that the church was trying to figure out whether that was a credible profession of faith. <laughs> I didn't watch the video when it dropped because I knew what it was. I haven't seen anything but the discussion about it and the little clips. I didn't watch the video because I wasn't trying to figure out if little Nas X was coming to Jesus. I'm not saying he won't. I pray he will. What a testimony that will be. But I'm going to say something, little Nas X, if you ever happen to run across this, because I know you're kind of self-obsessed. I know you probably search up a lot of stuff, and I pray in Jesus' name that the algorithm find this little discussion we're having about what you did. I'm going to say something to you. Somebody should have said to you a long time ago, little Nas X, Jesus is not your side quest. Jesus is not a trip on your adventure. Jesus is not a little bit of, that's what he meant when he gave us communion. He said, you gotta eat my flesh and drink my blood. That's what he said. He said, this bread is my body broken for you. This wine is my blood poured out for you. What he said to us is, you gotta take me all of me or none of me. Either you are all in or you are all out. That's what he was saying. What he was saying is you got to eat it, breathe it, live it, die it, walk it, talk it, be it. You can't do anything else. You are what you eat and you got to eat me. You want bread? I am the bread of life. Are you thirsty for another experience? And something to wake up the dead part inside of you. You don't need to try to decalcify your third eye. You need to let the blood of Jesus open up the gate back to Eden in your mind and set you free. Because whom the Son sets free is free indeed, and I'm not mad at you. I love you. And I'm sorry that Christians are having such a hard time saying it. And I wish that our brother Lecrae had, had, had not stuttered as much as he did. I'm thankful he's trying to speak to culture. But the Bible says we have to save as many as we can as though through fire hating even the garments stained by sin. We can't touch the unclean just because we're trying to snatch it out of the fire. So I have to say it to you without stumbling. Your filthy, perverted lifestyle. The games you're playing. You're going to lose. You're going to lose anyway. So you might as well lose it in Jesus. And let him make you new. there's been a disservice done to the Lord's church because the word church was, was chosen by the King James Version translators and those early translators. It's a gathering place, Scottish root. It's a gathering place. And unfortunately, the emphasis is more on the place than the gathering that verbiage, church, that's, that's new verbiage. That's not, that's not really true to the original. And a lot of people know that there's a, a, a Koine Greek term, koinonia, that speaks of the fellowship of the gathered body of believers, that Jesus Christ is manifest among us as we gather and we fellowship and, and we iron sharpens iron, meaning the, the blade... Of, of precision in our study, in our seeking him, in our desire to know him, in, in our lifestyle, it gets sharpened by bumping up against other believers. And, and so we can't 
we can't forsake the assembling of ourselves together because there's something that happens when we gather in his name and 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 it is it's not really the place it's the together unfortunately we've lost that understanding that we are what makes wherever we stand the place it it is the church because we are gathered here but even beyond the koinonia understanding there's a deeper understanding that we have to come to as a church right now that a lot of times where that word church is used in our english bible what we're actually talking about is that ecclesia word in in the greek which is a little stronger it's actually a lot stronger it's the called out ones it's the ones that are not supposed to be participating in the lifestyle the habits, the addictions, the pleasures, the desires, the the priorities of the culture around us. We're the called out ones. And King James was a little uncomfortable with that. King James was a little unsure how much emphasis he wanted to put on that. That terminology carries a sense of a different government. It carries the sense of a, of a, of a kingdom established that doesn't entirely answer to the kings of this world. King James thought that politically that word ecclesia was a little dicey because it gave the church a little too much power when we're gathered. It let us know who we are together a little bit too directly, that we would have an understanding that if the kings and gods of this world have assembled themselves against the Most High, that if the church will come together as one new creature in Christ and and unite ourselves, heart and soul, and say, I see you, and I know that you got a lot of issues, and I know you see me, and I know you know I've got got a lot of issues, and I don't even like some of you that much, and I definitely wouldn't go sit with you and and and, and just uh, pass the time for no reason, but I see Jesus coming to me in your eyes, and when you cry tears at the altar, I know that the same spirit that works in me is working in you, and so I'm going to lay down all of my opinions about you. I'm going to lay down all of my judgments and everything that I feel and all of whether I like you or not or whether I agree with you or not and I'm just going to say Holy Ghost make us one make us one as Jesus prayed let us be one because I understand that if we will be united in our desires if our hunger will be united for him if our thirst will be united for the 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 rain, the gentle rain of his spirit, if our hunger and our thirst will come together as one, then everything else will disappear and suddenly we will have the power among us to make kingdom edicts, you don't hear me right now, to to say a word and that word will be as creative as the in the beginning God said, let there be light in in the beginning, well, there's a new beginning happening every time the church gathers and the, the, the king of this world thought it's a little dangerous for them to know that I can make an edict that they can gather and override. They used to say that the sun never set on the British Empire during the height of colonial days. Y'all want to know why a lot of us think about the Roman Empire several times a day? It's because one of these days you're going to wake up and smell the coffee and understand that this is the Roman Empire. You are going to wake up and realize one day That just because a particular system of government fell apart, the princes that ruled the principalities that were governed by that, they didn't go anywhere. They just changed their approach. 
Some of you have been observant enough to notice that not every presidential election actually changes the regime, so to speak. A lot of you have noticed it on the other side of the aisle. That's good, that's the beginning of awareness. That's some knowledge that's helpful. But don't get too self-satisfied or too impressed with yourself. Don't look down on the people on the other side of the aisle just because they don't see that a president that they elected is actually continuing the, the, uh, the, the, the vision, the, the policies, the strategies, pursuing the same ends as a president before them. Because I hate to tell you this, but one of these days, he's going to add wisdom and understanding to the knowledge that you've got. And you're going to wake up and realize that it happened on your side of the aisle too. And that really every single one of these heads of state that we elect is just a, a proxy for a spirit that is governing a nation at a given time. They cannot be embodied in human form anymore. They're not allowed to. He killed them off and they're trying to find a way back in into human form. They used to be among us, the giants that lived among us. They can't find that human form anymore, but they're still hungry. They still have to feed off the misery. You don't hear me right now. You, you, somebody said we're being harvested. Yes, we're being harvested, but we're not being harvested by little green men. We're being harvested by ancient spirits that are at work in the world. We're being harvested by lust, the lust of the flesh the lust of the eyes and the pride of life every time you find yourself doom scrolling instead of fulfilling the will of the father who sent you every time you realize that you're completely dependent upon the mess that's being fed 24 hours a day 375 days uh, 365 days a year into your consciousness every time you catch a, a, a sight of that lie you got to wake up and realize I'm being and harvested. Somebody's making money off of my anxiety. Somebody's making money off of my confusion. Somebody is monetizing my ignorance. Somebody is benefiting. And so people get really upset at the system. I'm breaking out of the matrix. I'm going to tell you something that's going to hurt your feelings because a lot of you are not and I'm talking to myself, nowhere near as conscious as you think you are. You remember the movie Inception? Just talking with the pastors about that. Like with everything, they told us how it works. The, the enemy of your soul is laughing. He is laughing. And I, for one, am sick and tired of being the butt of his joke. The Bible I read says that he who sits in the heavens laughs. That's my God. It's not in the Bible, but it, it, it follows with it. He who laughs last laughs best. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. I know some of these, these churches have gotten crazy with holy laughter, and I know some it gets out of control, but I feel a, 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 uh, a directive from the Holy Ghost today. It hit me as I was praying and preparing for this service today, and the Holy Ghost spoke to me, and I'm I, I, in nearly, nearly audible terms, maybe internally audible would be the way to say it, and said there are several in this room who are so hollowed out inside from being harvested by the God 
gods of this world. Now listen, you say, I can't, that can't be me. I'm Holy Ghost filled. I'm a saved believer. I'm born again, yes. But while we inhabit this flesh, we remain susceptible if we're not on our guard to some of the, the dissolution that is in this world. And so we got to make sure that even though outwardly we are wasting away, inwardly we are being renewed day by day. We can't let up on making sure that what's inside is being fed and, and, and being made new. So I want to say to you, it's, it's not to say you're not a legitimate believer. I am not saying that and I don't believe it. It's not to say you weren't filled with his spirit. I, I'm not saying that and I don't believe it. But I am here to say if it's been a minute since you've been so renewed in the baptism of his spirit or if you've never been so overcome by the baptism, by the outpouring on you of the spirit of the living God that you were completely overwhelmed and the ego was annihilated in the presence of God. If somebody looked you in the eyes and said, what's your name? You wouldn't know how to answer them. You wouldn't understand what they're saying because you'd be so far gone in his presence that you would have lost all idea of who you are outside of him. And when you speak, it comes out in a language nobody understands around you, but your soul knows and God knows and you can make fun of it and you can talk about it and you can make your little little arguments about why it's not a thing and all of that. But I came to tell you somebody today is a believer and you've been living for God for a long time, but there's no laughter in your mouth. When the Lord brought back the captivity of Zion, we were like them that dreamed, uh, the psalmist said. Then our mouths were filled with laughter and our tongues with songs of praise. Uh, but it's been a long time uh, since that belly laugh came up out of the depths of my soul and I felt the joy of the Lord falling fresh on me uh, and the Holy Ghost made me new. And I came to tell you today, it's hard to kick against the goads when he's trying to point you in a direction. Stop fighting Jesus. Stop talking about the church. Stop talking about the people around you. This is inception. You've been waking up in layers, but you're still asleep if you don't understand that the call is coming from inside the house. Jesus said, if any man thirsts, let him come unto me, and uh, I will give him uh, a drink from a well that won't run dry, and out of his belly, out of his gut, out of the middle of him shall flow rivers of living water. I need a believer who needs some laughter back in their soul to stand to their feet right now. Throw open your arms and let him feel you. I feel the joy of the Lord falling fresh on me. I feel the joy of the Lord delivering me. I know the situation hasn't changed in the natural, but I feel happy. I feel a little joy. I know I still got a long road ahead, but I feel a little dance coming back. It's been a minute, but I feel free. I'm feeling free. It's good news when the call is coming from inside the house because Jesus lives in that house. Oh, how Y'all can stay with me like that, just for a minute, band. Y'all can stay with me. You can be seated, though, if you want to. Matthew 12, Matthew 12, verse 35. Y'all, excuse me, hiking up my britches like this. You wouldn't believe this day. I forgot to put product in my hair. I really did. Then I lost enough weight that my pants are falling off and unfortunately, I don't have a rear bumper. And then my belt broke and it wasn't for once because it was too tight. I'm gonna dance anyway.
Jesus said, man, there's going to be a lot of false teachers come among you. A lot of deceivers. A lot of people going to come in my name. Have you ever stopped and wondered about, was talking with somebody this week, can't even remember who. Maybe it was Pastor Jonathan again because we had a long conversation at one point this week, but I was talking with somebody and we were saying, it's kind of uncomfortable when we realize it says, come in my name. I thought that if we come in his name, we have authority. I thought that if two or three are gathered in his name, there am I among them. Yeah. Yeah. But sometimes... I saw a, 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 a picture in the news this week standing outside the courthouse where they were deciding the fate of the law enforcement involved in that horrific incident in, in what, I guess it's South Texas, South Texas, that school incident. And somebody, it's probably family of somebody sitting in the back of that room holding up a sign, handwritten, that said, if you didn't do your job, lay down your badge. Sometimes people flash the badge, but they're just hirelings. They're not here about the purpose. It's a dangerous thing to get into law enforcement in the little country town because you say nothing crazy happens here anyway. I get the benefit of standing behind that blue line, shielding myself from, from a lot going on around me. I get the benefits of the fraternity, but I don't really have to risk what you got to risk to be in that club. I know there's issues. I know there's trouble. I know we need certain reforms and this and that. But you know as well as I do that a lot of people that get into that business in places where you don't get paid enough to live on and you can die any day, a lot of people that get into that, that line of work, they do it because somewhere down in their soul, there's an injustice that they witnessed at some point in their life. And they decided, I can't do anything to change that, but I'm going to spend the rest of my life trying to make sure that nobody ever has to deal with that right there because somebody's got to be serving and somebody's got to be protecting. And those are the good ones. But then along, come the ones that want a little bit of a smoke screen and a little bit of power and a little bit of authority so they can maneuver things the way they want to maneuver them and, and be a part of uh, uh, taking and be a part of that harvesting of the misery of society to monetize it. And so we say they're on the make. They're on the make in New York and Chicago and LA and they're on the make and they're on the take. They're made men by some organization and they're on the take from somebody. They're profiteering. There's protection rackets. There's all this going on and they're flashing the badge. They're coming in the name of NYPD. They're coming in, but really they represent the Gambinos or really they represent some other authority, some other uh, principality working behind the scenes that makes money off of the more misery that, that has a way of monetizing death and destruction. And, and so they come not but to steal, kill, and destroy, and they walk among us. But then there's another kind, and I think I have the least respect for those ones. I'm not saying I know what happened with the ones in South Texas. We'll let a judge decide about that. But I'm here to do today to say they exist. The ones exist that go, I could go somewhere where nothing ever happens, and I could make just a, a, a comfortable life. They're not trying to get rich off of 
anybody's misery. They're not trying to, 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 to profit off of the system. They're, they're the ones, if you read Revelation 18, Revelation uh, the, about the mystery Babylon, they're the ones that stand far off and look at Babylon and say, I hope she recovers from this recession. I hope World War III really doesn't happen because I make a lot of money off of her and they don't know World War III is a done deal. It's in the books. When they, when we look back on this 20 years from now, if he tarries, they're going to tell what day that World War III started and it's not in 2024. I know it hasn't kicked totally into gear, but they're going to tell us this thing happened and from that time on, it was a done deal. But I came to tell you, you people don't understand what they're profiting off of. People don't understand what they're hiding behind is a system that exists to create misery and destruction and oppression. But a lot of people like to stand in the comfort zone far enough away from the action that they don't have to acknowledge what it actually is, but just close enough that they can ride the coattails of it. And so you get people like law enforcement officers that don't want to have anything to do with anything that might actually cost them something. The Bible calls them hirelings. Now listen, church, you can talk a lot of mess about me if you want to. If you want to pick me apart, you can pick me apart, and there's a lot you can find to say about me. But I'm going to tell you a couple things you can't say about me. One thing you cannot say about me is that I have ever gotten in this pulpit and delivered to you my soul and for one moment been hiding gross sin, living like the devil and talking like an angel of light. I will not represent a gospel I am not adhering to. I will not preach a cross I am not dying on. I will not preach a resurrection I am not a partaker in. And so I have never got behind this sacred desk. God help me with open, unrepentant sin in my life. But you can pick a lot of the rest of it apart. He doesn't see himself. He doesn't know how he's coming across. He talks about one thing, but clearly he's got other issues. He's not totally where he should be. Okay, but I'll tell you another thing you can't say about me. You can't say I'm a hireling. You can't say that I'm here because I'm getting something off of it. You can't say that. You can't say I saw an opportunity and swooped in. You can't say that. You can't say that I came because I wanted to be a senior pastor. I was already a senior pastor. We had more that was ours then than we do now. I came about the blood of Jesus. I came about the flock. I came about the kingdom. I came about the law in this city. I came about the message of repentance from sin and dead works and faith toward God and of baptism in water in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and the resurrection in filling of the Holy Ghost to do more than just shop up a ball over the stage but to represent the king and his kingdom in this world. Matthew 12 and 35, he said it like this, because he's telling them how to discern who's false and who's real. The good man out of his good treasure brings forth what is good. I go back to verse 33 and read it here. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad. I'm done so we can, you can sit, stand, lie, whatever you want to do. They were saying he was doing great things, but he was doing them for the wrong reasons and by the wrong power. He said, you can't have it both ways. You can't pick an apple from a tree and accuse it of being a plum. Either make the tree good and its fruit good or make the tree bad and its fruit bad for the tree is known by its fruit. And then he called them a brood of snakes. 
You brood of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak what is good? For the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. The good man brings out of his good treasure what is good, and the evil man brings out of his evil treasure what is evil. But I tell you that every careless word that people speak, they shall give an accounting for it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. What are you saying, Pastor? Just a minute, you had us shouting about the joy of the Lord. Now that sounds a little threatening. The joy of the Lord does not exist without the fear of God. But the fear of God does not produce the kind of anxiety and, and mistrust and oppression and hate that the fear of man produces. Oh, I feel it, I feel it, I feel it. The fear of man is what's behind the mess that we see in religion. It's preachers that won't preach the whole counsel of God because they're afraid of the face of the people. Let me tell you something, preacher, press on. Press on. You better not give up now. You better not stop now. No man, Jesus said having put his hand to the plow and looking back is worthy to be my disciple. He said, remember Lot's wife. Whatever you're looking at is where you're headed. Press on, preacher. Preach the word. Be instant when it's convenient and instant when it's inconvenient. Rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and patience as one who must give an account. You got to press on. You got to say the thing. Don't be afraid of the face of the people. If they're looking at you like that, they won't be there next week. Don't be scared of them. If they're looking at you like that because you're preaching the truth, Paul said, am I therefore become your enemy? Because I tell you the truth, if they're mean mugging you, they're either going to wind up just like you did down here at the foot of the cross, laying it all on the altar and let Jesus take it and you'll see them made alive or they're going to leave. So stop being afraid. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Where is my joy gone? There are people in this room right now. You're listening to me. I, I know who you are, some of you. I can see you. I can see the deadness in your eyes. I can see the lack of ability to connect to anything anymore. I can see that you don't even care about the things that used to discourage you. Some of you are here at this church this morning, not because you're trying to be faithful and not because you even uh, are, are believing God for a miracle anymore. Some of you are here at this church because you just don't care anymore. You gave up believing that God would do anything. You gave up believing that you could do anything. You gave up believing anything could change. But somehow there's a habit built up in you that you just keep coming back and you keep coming back. Well, I've got good news for you. That means the Lord knows them that are his. That's him that keeps drawing you back. I know you you don't feel him anymore, but you can see him in the fact that you're here, in the fact that you made it. The fruit is good because the root is good, but I can see in your eyes the deadness that you just, you don't even know how to want it anymore. What came to tell you something today? My job is to prophesy to the dead bones. My job is to prophesy as I have been commanded. My job is to cry aloud and spare not, but it's him that breathes on you. 
It's him that will make you alive. Some of you are, have left and, and you get on and you watch our feed because you're still curious about it, but you don't even know exactly why you left. Just over time, a feeling of discontentment and offense built up inside of you. And you left and you're not even sure why you left. And you sure haven't found anything where you've gone, but you keep getting on the feed and just peeking in and you're not really sure why. And I came to tell you today that it's not really a, 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 an unusual experience to just kind of go dead inside for a minute. But if the sun has breathed on you, ain't no devil in hell can choke that breath of life out of you. You're going to have to give up your eternity if you want to lose it. I came to tell you, press on, discouraged one. Press on, weary one. Press on, embittered one. Keep reaching for the cross. Keep running toward Calvary. Keep clawing your way along the blood street path. You don't give up on him. He's not giving up on you. And there's something inside of you that hasn't come out in a long time. What time is it? 1.10. You could come down here inside of 20 minutes. You could not only be refilled, restored, or if you've never felt what I'm talking about, be filled for the first time. You could have the most world-altering encounter with the one, the I am, the beginning and the end. He could change the whole trajectory of your journey in this mortar coil, and you could still leave this house by 1.30 if you really want to. It doesn't take any time. It just takes being all in. I need somebody. Listen, I've touched on this before, but I need somebody who's, who's not going to let go until he blesses you. I need somebody who's done crying about what cannot seem to be to come down here and lay hold on Jesus. I felt something this week in the challenge of the Holy Ghost. I felt something come out of me I haven't felt in a minute. I felt like he said to me in my personal devotion, the problem is not that you don't know how to shout anymore. The problem is not that you don't know how to get excited anymore. The problem is what excites you. We are excited when the preacher says, sow your seed of $24 and you'll have 2,400% return this year. We are excited when the preacher says, you're blessed, you're above only and not beneath. We are excited when the preacher says, if I have done all that mess, all I gotta do is say a prayer and keep it moving. We're excited when we find out we don't have to pay a price but we used to get excited when we woke up in the morning. The thing that used to get us moving at church is I feel like Jesus is with me. And if I don't feel it, I know it. We used to shout because he said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. We used to rejoice because he said, even if you die, I'll raise you again. We used to rejoice because I woke up this morning and I started on my way. Come on, somebody. Somebody that's ready for joy out of the middle of your soul. If you've never had it, if it's been years, come with me. Come with me to the foot of the cross. Let's get full of Jesus. Let's let him fill us with his spirit, wash us with his blood, cleanse us with his word, and let's leave this place a part of a 